Good day to you and Happy New Year. And to bring in the new year, I'd like to talk to you about something I know very little about. <laughs> yeah, that's not really true, but it's true to a large extent because we're taking on two twin subjects today. I should say one twin subject, which you all are more experts in than me because you're living in this age and you are practicing these forms of mass media. I'm talking about social media and I'm talking about video games. That's our subject for today as we take on chapter 10 in the book and finish out the second the second two thirds of the course, so to speak. We're taking on social media and video games. And you don't need me to tell you that social media are a central part of most people's lives. Central part is putting it mildly. Some people are on social media all day long. They can't pry themselves away from it. You know people like that. Maybe you are yourself a person like that. Maybe you're a person actually who are like many others out there who have found social media so addicting that you've given yourself a break from it. You've gone off of Facebook and even announced it or gone off of Instagram or Snap or whatever social media you're using, you've left it because it's too compelling to you. So let's start with some definitions because social media has changed the game when it comes to mass media. Social media are very different from legacy mass media. So the first thing that we want to say that makes social media different is there are there is user-generated content. That means that the content is not being produced by professional script writers and producers and editors and all those other trained professionals in media. Social media content is being created by you. We've already talked about that as big data and you being a prosumer. You're both prosuming and you're consuming when you're creating content, but that makes social media different. Also on social media, we have comments. We don't typically have that. When you watch a television show, you can't make comments. When you read a newspaper, you can make comments, but a lot of newspapers have shut that off. But comments are very popular. Or very, it's a very common feature of social media, as is tagging. Tagging people, bringing other people in who are part of your friends. If you have a closed, uh, closed social media network like Facebook or an open social media network like Twitter where you don't need to to uh, request a, to uh, approve a friendship request to have that person as part of your, your network tagging goes on. And then we have social networking. That's getting to know people all the time, meeting people, getting rid of people. Uh, this constant thing that we do in public, if we weren't on social media, we'd be meeting people, bumping into people. Some people would never come into our orbits ever again. And that's what social networking is all about. And then finally, we have customization. Customization refers to the ability to present yourself as you wish. I mean, the, the degree of profile settings that you can engage, filters, uh, all the different takes just for a photo that you can use on your camera. And ten, take 10, take 11, take 12. Okay, that's the photo I like that shows me in the best pose possible for my profile picture. That's what customization is all about. In short, social media have transformed time and distance once again in the legacy of mass media. We talked about how that happened when electronic media came on, change space and distance. You didn't have to transport media anymore. Social media are doing that as well. So let's highlight the various social media platforms that the chapter talks about, starting with YouTube. YouTube owned by Google. I'm using YouTube right now, right? You're, you're watching videos for a class on a commercial media platform because I can't figure out an easier way to do it. If I record a video of this length on D2L, it's too big for D2L, so I use YouTube. So YouTube was founded by three friends and they used to work for Elon Musk's company, PayPal. Did you know Elon Musk owned PayPal before he owned Tesla? That's where he launched his financial fortune. He had three employees and these three employees figured that there was no easy way to share videos on the internet. It just wasn't easy. Like you try to send one, it gets bottled up, it's too big in an email. And so what do you do? So they founded YouTube. And YouTube is actually the most popular social media network. You can say it's more popular than Facebook in terms of use, not in terms of revenue. And as I mentioned, it was bought by Google today. So it's a Google property. Next up is Facebook. Facebook was created by Mark Zuckerberg. And that's highlighted in the film, The Social Network, if you've seen that. And he originally created Facebook as an instant messaging service, an IM service. You know, just like we talked about last class, and that's a different kind of software than, than the regular protocol for using the internet, those instant messaging services or chat services. He created Facebook as that so that his uh, father in his dentist office could bring patients back to the back rooms to be worked on without having to devote resources to sending people out to, fe to fetch those patients, patients, so to speak. And originally Facebook was called a walled garden. 
meaning you could have this beautiful place to yourself and you could keep people out if you want because you have control over your friends. Soon it became, though, a commercial platform and an advertising agency, like I've called it, where advertisers can reach exactly who are they, they are wanting. You know, I went down to buy tickets for a rock concert a year and a half ago in Bethlehem at the Bethlehem Casino, and I bought tickets for ZZ Top. And by the time I had gotten home, had arrived home half an hour later, which is 20, which is uh, 30 miles away or so, there were already tickets popping up for future events at the Wind Creek Center there in Bethlehem, and they were all rock bands. And that's what Facebook does. It knows exactly what you're doing, tracing your IP address and all the data that you are willingly inputting on there, as does Google and Amazon, and then they can target you with ads. Now let's talk about Instagram, the most popular social media platform amongst college students today. It's a photo sharing site. That's how it started out. The co-founders are Mike Krieger and Kevin Systrom, and they really uh, escalated uh, the importance of Instagram and its profile around the world when they added video and full frames and filters to it. And then eventually Instagram was bought by Facebook in 2012. Today, Instagram brings in about 30% of Facebook's overall ad revenue. And again, Instagram has been in the news a lot lately. Just the general premise is being examined that nobody's thought about. It just sort of developed under our eyes. And, and the premise is, is that uh, young people, particularly women, um, are creating images of themselves for strangers to look at. Interesting idea. All right, let's talk about Snap next. Uh, Snapchat is, is probably the second most popular media, uh, social media platform amongst my students. Very popular. It, it, it's very popular amongst young people, like up to 22, and then just falls off in terms of use. People stop using it. Of course, the, uh, the, the main feature of Snapchat is the auto-disappearing photos and messages, so you can lead a life and, and not have to... Um, uh, it, you know, suffer <laughs> the ramifications of bad behavior for the rest of your life because it disappears after just a few moments. And that's what the charm of Snapchat is. But it's harder to use if you're not on it several times a day. You're not in the mix for it. And also Snapchat has had trouble making money. It's not really a money maker like a Facebook is. Next up is Twitter. Twitter was developed by three dropouts from high school, Evan Williams, Jack Dorsey, and Biz Stone. And it's officially referred to as a micro-blogging network. Remember, a blog comes from that word weblog. So it's officially a micro-blogging network. Micro because the number of characters that you can use is limited. It used to be 140, I think it is. Now it's 280. And it was uh, originally used as a way to get in touch with stars directly. That was one of the ways it was used, to try and get to Kim Kardashian, try and get to uh, Nicki Minaj, whoever you can try and get to, and get them to respond to you. And then it became a way for businesses and audience to interact in a two-way fashion through Twitter. Uh, next up, we've got TikTok. TikTok has uh, really rose to prominence during the pandemic. A lot of people whiling their, their, their time away by watching TikTok, sharing short videos. That's what TikTok is all about, humorous videos for the most part with some graphics. It's actually owned by a Chinese company that has a history of censorship. And uh, it's very clever in the way that it advertises because TikTok advertises on Snapchat and YouTube. Very, 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 very tricky. And uh, what he's not even mentioned in here is WhatsApp. Uh, WhatsApp is another very, you know, it's a, it's a messaging platform, but it is used increasingly by businesses. Um, I, I fly an airline all the time called Volaris, V-O-L-A-R-I-S. It's a Mexican airline. If you fly on Volaris and you have a problem that you want to talk to customer service about, you got to do it through WhatsApp. I found that fascinating. All right, let's move on over, over into the world of video gaming, a gaming a world that I know very little about. I played some early video games, but uh, mostly I know about it by watching my son, uh, my 21-year-old son, not so much my daughter, but in, in watching his friends and others through video games. So you will be much better experts than me. Well, we'll start by saying that with Atari, the company Atari, A-T-A-R-I, popularized video games. Uh, that company was founded by Nolan Bushnell, B-U-S-N-E. B-U-S-H-N-E-L-L. -L. And the original game was Pong. And I can remember we had that game in our house. It was a black and white game that you plugged uh, controls, controllers into your television set to use. And it was all in black and white. It was two paddles, right? <laughs> and a round ball bouncing between them. And then it would start speeding up. And you had to, like, get your paddle on the ball. Otherwise, it shoots by and you lose the point. That was Pong. And uh, early games that were created by RT, uh 
uh, Atari, including Pong, were um, played in arcades. They were played in arcades as well. Arcades were in malls, still are in some places. You can find them down the, the boardwalk at the Jersey Shore as well. And you put quarters in. That's, that's how video gaming t took place out in the open like that in a one-on-one -on -one fashion. And uh, actually, Atari in 2006, uh, or, uh, actually, Atari's 2600 console, I should say, not 2006, Atari's 2600 console launched the home video game market. And uh, one of the games that was launched for this was Tank. And that means moving video games away from the arcade into the home, just like the VHS did for movies and films. Eventually, Pong sold the com uh, Atari sold the company to Warner, the Warner Company. All right, we're going to talk now about the importance of arcades so that we have an understanding of the kind of social function that those arcades filled for people, particularly young people. In malls, young people gathered around them. Young people didn't have a lot of money. They had quarters, if that. And so that's where they couldn't go to any bars in the mall and didn't want to go to high-end fashion. So they're in, in arcades. And at the time, a piece of technology was being developed that accelerated the ability of video games to represent real life and even go beyond real life in terms of graphics and sound and all that. It was called the microprocessor, the microprocessor, which is at the heart of computers, really. And so um, the arcade business and the arcade lifestyle really flourished. Mostly it was appealing to males. I can remember going to the mall, and that's what we do. We'd go into the arcade, and we'd play um, Asteroids and a lot of their games, just whiling the time away. And until this big game hit, and that was Pac-Man. Pac-Man took the arcades by storm. Everybody was playing Pac-Man and this version Pac-Woman as well. So, uh, but the home console market kind of flagged because compared to arcades, arcades, the home technology was not as advanced. The graphics, the sound, everything was not as good as in the arcades until Nintendo comes along. And Nintendo comes along. <clears throat> it was a hundred year old company and it kicked off a video game console surge with the Nintendo Entertainment System. And it produced all these games which are considered classic legacy video games today like Super Mario, Donkey Kong, Legend of Zelda. So Nintendo broke open the mold of what video games should look like and they developed a tiny little device. It looked like a cell phone. It was called Nintendo Game Boy. It was like this long. My brother and I used to play it all the time. One person at one end, the other person at the other end. You're playing football. You're trying to run the guy down the field and not get tackled. So they invented a Nintendo Game Boy that was also making smaller, making more miniature the technology of being able to video game. Next up is Sony, Sony with its PlayStation, and we're also going to compare that with Microsoft's Xbox. So Sony's PlayStation was the first to make substantial sales from 3D polygon graphics. I said that like, like, like that because I don't really know what that means, but it sounds incredibly sophisticated and, and very stimulating as well. The PlayStation 5, that was it, PlayStation 5. And then Microsoft comes out with the Xbox to go after an older audience than Sony's PlayStation. They were going after with sports and first-person shooter games. The Xbox was built for online play. That was a big breakthrough in video gaming. It took it away from the mall, out of the household, and put it onto the globe. Because now you can video game with people you don't know, just like you can social network with people on social media that you don't know. Uh, Nintendo later came out with the Wii system. The Wii system trying to incorporate physical exercise, like playing tennis, holding a racket, and actually playing a game for winter sports if you're locked in your house, but also because of criticisms that video gaming were creating lazy people who are not in shape. So let's move now to talk about conflicts about video games, conflict about video games. And you will know these subjects better than I. Almost any time there is a, a mass murder um, or a shooting, uh, one of the things that's looked at is whether the shooter, usually a male, had a video game appetite. Beyond that, though, there are individual games that have had problems like Death Race. Death Race upset critics because it was about running people over with cars. Atari's rape-themed game, Custer's Revenge, was criticized. Mortal Kombat featured outrageous violence. And all of this led the video industry, just video gaming industry, just like film, just like TV, to come up with its own rating system. And uh, none of this really thwarted the fact that Grand Theft Auto gave players the freedom to go through any path in the city to commit crime and became 
the equivalent of a blockbuster movie, Grand Theft Audio. It took four years to create that piece of software, and, and the leg zone is tremendous, still a very popular game. Uh, let's move over to something that you may not have considered to be social media or gaming. That's Pokemon. Pokemon is a wholesome, friendly, I don't know how it can be those things, when it's a combat-based game. It was launched in 1996. It comes out of Japan, and it's anime um, tradition, animation. And then Pokemon broke into the virtual reality world, the gaming world, with its reality Pokemon um, series, where it had people going all over their yards to try and capture these little mini Pokemon figures on their cell phones. And Starbucks and Sprint advertised within this game, showing, again, mass media, even in the area of video gaming, is, is heavily involved in profit-making and cross-promotion all the time. So what we're really talking about here are, are video games are mass consumption. Video games are mass media. Consoles are the primary content delivery devices, what plugs into the wall or an Ethernet cable or your television. Xbox is actually pitched as a general purpose entertainment hub or cable television. Video games have stars in them today. The Rock, for example. Video games are a venue for advertisers. We just mentioned two of them. Players communicate in headsets with each other, often oblivious to the world going on around outside of them. I can remember so many times when my son was in that age range of 16 up until 20, where he'd be gaming in his room in the basement, and I would be calling down the stairs, Gordon, Gordon, Gordon. He wouldn't hear me at all, even though I was raising my voice louder each time because I didn't want to have to walk down the stairs. Sometimes I'm banging the wall, he still wouldn't hear, still wouldn't hear me because those cans, those headphones, are enveloping the video gamer in a reality that is completely cordoned off from the reality that exists outside of that. Some video games are more popular than movies today. Now let's talk about video games as a spectator sport. This is another development in the industry of video games. A fish named Grayson playing... Pokemon is one of the first video games to advance this whole idea. It's the idea that you are watching others playing video games. And PewDiePie is the most famous person on the internet for doing this, the Swedish gamer and his commentary that takes place. And, and there are all kinds of associations like eSports. ESU has an eSports club. Our colleague, my colleague, Dr. Christopher Weeks, is the advisor to that club, eSports, if you're interesting. ESPN holds video gaming competitions. So video gaming is a spectator sport. Also, video games is making, are making their appearances more in contemporary culture. You are finding video gaming used for meetings, weddings, and concerts. And I got to tell you, I went to see Spider-Man last night, and it had the feel of a video game. To me, really, as an in, as in, inexperienced and third-party observer, the, the worlds of film and video gaming seem to be coming closer together in form, and just the look and the feel of them even though that wasn't you know, a Marvel film, so you'd expect it to be naturally more like video gaming. Last up today, we're going to talk about diversity and representation in video games. And much like other media, we find the same similar unfortunate trends here that video games typically are dominated by white, male, heterosexuals, which is not in and of itself bad, but when you don't have representation of other people who are living in our society in video games, a form of popular culture and mass consumption, that's a problem. Even though, even though despite the skewing towards white male heterosexuals, if you look at the demographics of video gamers, more LGBTQ people and more Asians play video games than white people, but they're less likely to be representative. There are many, many positive developments in video gaming. As you well know, though, you can take on any persona and character. You're white, you want to play a black female in a video game, no problem. You're Asian, you want to play a white guy, no problem. You can do that in shows like, in uh, video games like Xbox's Saints Row. It's, it's no problem at all. So we're going to leave things here with you to consider for the most important um, aspects of this class today, since you are the experts, where has video gaming come and social media come in the history of what we studied in mass media and where will they take us? Have a great day.